Good morning, New Life Manitou. Good you guys can go ahead and stand, or stay standing. My name is Danae Glass, and the scripture reading for this morning is from Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, these words are about joy, a letter from a man to a group of people that he just finds so much joy in. And Lord, today I pray that this joy would be in us, the joy ultimately that comes from you, Jesus, the creator of all, that has revealed yourself to us, that inside of us deep will be joy. So Lord, we praise you, we thank you, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people shouted with joy. Amen. Amen. All right, sit down. Thanks for being here this morning. I have a little metaphor. Some of you will know right where I'm going with this off the bat. But once upon a time, there was a girl, a young girl. She uh, picked up a book of a young man. So she found a fictional uh, a novel by a young man. And she picked it up because it was, uh, he was from her city. So she gets this book. She starts reading it. She gets a chapter or two or three in. And she's just like, eh, it's, it's well written. It's a good book. I just, I, I don't know. I got other books to read. So she puts it on a shelf. And there it sits for a couple days, a couple months. A couple years pass. And then this young woman meets this young man who was the author of this book. It's like, oh, that's interesting. She, she meets him. They, they, they hit it off. They, they tell each other their names. They, they find each other on Facebook. Is that what you do these days, you kids? You Snapchat one another? Is that what the kids are doing? <laughs> Anyways, uh, they start, to, they start a romantic relationship. And so this young man, this young woman uh, begin going on dates. And then she's like, oh yeah, I have his book on the shelf. And so with a whole new joy, with a whole new idea of reading, she picks this book off the shelf and she starts reading and devouring this book thinking, oh, maybe he's like this character in this book. She reads it for clues and get to know this guy. Do you know where I'm going with this metaphor? Some of you might not. Some of you will. We are studying Philippians today. We are going to be studying Philippians for the next 13 weeks. And my prayer for you, for some of you that have put the Bible on the shelf, is that you will fall in greater love with the Father, with the one who has inspired this book, and you will see him and see his works, see his hands. You will get to know him as we study this word. Good, good enough metaphor. Some of you are just looking at me like I'm crazy. I've been thinking about this all week as like, I hope that when they hear this, they will be encouraged to read scripture because we know the author. Like we can get to know the author by reading this text. So more about that in just a few minutes. We're studying the book of Philippians for 13 weeks. So if you would, uh, bear with me with my, another silly joke, but would you flip to... <laughs> Philippians. So if you have a Bible, go there, turn to Philippians 1. We are going to be looking at this book, and then uh, from Philippians, we are going to flip from Philippians to the book of Acts a little bit later. So I'll tell you that in a few minutes. If you have a hard time finding Philippians, it's with a bunch of books. Uh, I always remember it as Go Eat Popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Anybody with me? Do you need little mnemonics for turning? Okay, never mind. Uh, I'm like 0 for 3 right now. Um, the book of Philippians. Three points this morning. Last week was two points. This sermon's going to be better. It's got all three points. The book of Philippians, point number one, is divinely inspired for us. Uh, we will look at who the Philippians are. That's point number two. And then we will look at this overwhelming theme in the whole book of Philippians that we see here in Philippians 1, 1 through 4, which is joy. A three-letter word, joy permeates. So that's the three points of this sermon today. The book of Philippians, this is point number one. The book of Philippians is divinely inspired for us. 
It's divinely inspired for us because the gravity of Philippians centers around this key idea that Jesus, one in being with the Father, fully God in in the same nature as God himself, came to this earth as one of us. This is this poem in chapter two that Paul has all these individual stories and vignettes and things he wants to say and they are like a solar system going around and around this key principle, this key poem in Philippians chapter two which is that the Lord himself, Jesus is God and we can get to know him and that's where this joy comes from. So as we begin to talk about Philippians, this is maybe... In a sermon series, this is sometimes my favorite part of a sermon series, which is the introduction of a sermon series and kind of the background, especially when it's about a Bible book. We're going to get a little nerdy in here today. Is that okay with some of you? Uh, Putting on our thinking caps. We might even do a nerd alert. In fact, a nerd alert is when I say the words nerd alert and then you make an alert sound. For those of you that are new, I apologize. This is weird. We keep Manitou weird. This is one of the small ways, but it kind of just... I used to teach a college age uh, Sunday school and we would, I just loved the nerdy stuff. And so bear with me if nerdy stuff is not your thing. It's my thing. I think it's awesome. So nerd alert. (laughs) Okay, that's good. Um, uh, The nerd alert is that we are going to do exegesis and hermeneutics. We're going to talk a little around who wrote this letter, uh, who this letter was written to, because these things matter. This letter was not written to us. There's this not a trick question here, but the book of Philippians is written to the Philippians. Philippians. Yeah, I'm not tricking you. It's it's written from Paul and Timothy. Um, that's who it says it's from. Although in the letter is just I language, like I pray for you. So it's not like we. So it's Paul and Timothy, but we know it's really Paul doing the thinking here and writing. And so Paul writes to the Philippians, do you live in Philippi? No, you, no one does. I've been there. It's an ancient town that is just ruins. It's like a museum city now, about four football fields. Is, is, you can walk around it and it's, uh, I've been there. I'll talk about that. I've had the joy of being to this site myself, but no one lives there now. And so it's not written to us. It's written for us. And so if you're writing down phrases and like, what, what am I saying right here? I, I will say this again and then I'll be clear about what it means because I am wanting to lift the Bible up to its proper place of authority and God's word for us, not bring it down. But I will say this, that the Bible is not written to us, it's written for us. And what I mean by that is, is to get quite literal here, Paul is writing to the Philippians in this passage we are studying, this whole book of the Bible. It's not written to us, but you better believe that I believe it's for us. It's for today. It inspires us. It is in the inspired word of God. It is certainly for us today. And so we are going to study it as such that we might know uh, technically the author is Paul, but t- also he, the Lord himself inspired it through Paul. And so we can look at these words and be encouraged and feel this joy that Paul wrote to this church in Philippi. Or when I was there, the Greeks call it Philippi. So I might call it Philippi, which is kind of weird because I've always, always, always heard it called Philippi. So Philippi was the city. It was a very Roman city. I think about it as um, kind of a, uh, like I've spent a lot of time as an Air Force kid. My dad was in the Air Force. And so we'd go to these Air Force bases that were fully American uh, places, but in Germany. I was in fact born on an Air Force base in Turkey. I'm not Turkish. I was born on technically not really American soil, but an outpost of the United States in Turkey. And for some ways, in some ways, Philippi was like that, a city, a colony of Rome outside of Italy in what is today Greece. We can show a picture, uh, if you guys could put up, a, we have a picture, a, a map of uh, this, this kind of arm looking thing at the top right, that's Turkey. Uh, Paul's gonna talk about how he's in Troas and then he goes across uh, to Philippi. Do you see it at the very top middle? And then there's the rest of Greece there in the middle, then that, uh, that little, uh, what is that, like a, is a, a, the boot, the cowboy boot, that is, of course, Italy. And so we see that Philippi is in what is today Greece. It's near uh, Turkey, the border. Here's another map for you. We'll leave this one up because I'll refer to this one in just a minute. But the city of Philippi was this ancient city. It had public bathrooms. It had a forum. It had a market 
space. It had a bathhouse, a gym, a jail, a library, temples to Roman uh, and Greek gods. It had a huge theater that the Greeks built for shows and the Romans turned into like uh, a coliseum type thing for animal fights and for potentially where Christians were uh, killed or fought gladiators or wild animals there in Philippi. I've been to this place, the ruins of it. Um, it was along a road. This is the Via Ignatia. I think that's how you say it. That the red line going across all of Greece was built by the Romans. And so Paul hears a voice. We'll talk about this in a minute. To go to Macedonia and the ancient city of Philippi was in Macedonia. And so he goes to this city, which is sort of the capital of the region. So far, so good. Are you with me? Are you awake? Those of you that are nerdy are like taking notes. It's like, this is the best sermon ever. Some of you that are just like, get to the point. What's that? Like, well, how does this apply? We'll get there. We'll get there. Please stay with me. Just relax. So Paul is in prison writing to the Philippians. We're not sure exactly where Paul is. He could be in Ephesus. He could be in Rome. He could be somewhere else. But he meets the Philippians. He plants a church. And about 10 years later, he writes this letter back. What's interesting is we have the record of Paul first going to Philippi. And we'll look at this story. It's quite a beautiful story in just a couple of minutes. But to uh, kind of give away a little bit of the ending, to spoiler alert it, this is the first time, because Greece is in what is today the continent of Europe. Uh, Turkey would be considered uh, Asia Minor or even the Middle East. When Paul steps foot into Philippi and spreads the good news there of Jesus Christ, this is the first time in history that the word of the Lord is spread into Europe. A pretty big deal for a lot of us that are part of the Western culture and being influenced by Europe. A pretty big deal for those of us that have European descent. The very first person converted that we know of in Europe is this woman. Let's think about this, like the importance of women in the text of the Bible, in the Christian story and the Christian message. Uh, in a time when Rome said women should not even vote, women could not even bear testimony. If they saw a crime, they couldn't testify because supposedly in this world, this ancient world, women could not be trusted. But Paul lifts up women and Christianity lifts up women to a very high place. And the very first convert in all of Europe is a woman by the name of Lydia. We'll talk about her in just a minute. And so in some ways, our great, great, great grandmother in the Christian faith tradition is this woman named Lydia. We'll talk about her in just a second. But back to this idea that Paul is writing from prison. One of the main themes Paul wants to do here with this book of Philippians is to thank them for their gifts. So we live in a world where um, if you go to prison today, everything you need is taken care of for you your housing, your food, your clothing, the guards, et cetera. I looked up some stats this week of what it costs to keep a prisoner in prison. And sometimes the costs are upwards. This would be on the high end, but upwards of $60,000 a year per prisoner in incarceration, which is well, that's a lot of money in my mind, just to keep someone in prison. That's the high end. But in Paul's day, in the ancient world, someone would be literally just chained to the prison. And were they offered clothes? No. Were they offered food? No. They were offered nothing. The only way they would have anything is if people brought it to them, which in the Roman way of thinking, in the jail kind of system uh, of thinking, if you wanted to find out who this person was working with, co-conspirators, you just put them in jail long enough and see who would come to bring them food and clothing, and then you would have them as well. So this is a very dangerous thing for these Philippians to be looking out for Paul, sticking their necks out for Paul, and bringing them, bringing Paul food and clothing and money and things that he needed. But they do that. Paul writes them and thanks them again and again. Again, um, and and it's always a part of. I think about jail. I, I get to as a pastor visit jail. I was I was in a jail this weekend or last earlier this week on Monday visiting someone, and uh, two weeks ago I was visiting someone in El Paso who uh, is in incarceration. And it usually comes up like there's usually some sort of need prisoners have the jail system we have today. Everything you need is covered for you, but there's certain things that you can get if you have money on your commissary card. This is how most 
prisons work. Some of you are familiar with this. And so you put money on a prisoner's uh, kind of commissary card and they can go spend things that they don't need but maybe really want, like coffee, which in my mind, is that a gray area between need and want? I think it, I don't know. But, but there's, it, always, it comes up in conversation. Like, do you, do you have resources you can give me on my commissary card? And you hear that here in Paul's letter. However, the Philippians have gone above and beyond and supplied Paul with all his needs. And so he goes on to thank them. Uh, I won't read all of this, but in Philippians 4, uh, starting in verse like 5, Paul just thanks them again and again. Yeah, verse 18 says, I'm amply su- supplied uh, and goes on to say, your gift to me was like a fragrant offering, pleasing to God. Thank you so much for giving me what you've given me. And, and may you be uh, the Lord meet all of your needs to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. So this letter is to thank the Philippians. And then um, we get to the meat of this sermon of uh, later, which is all about joy. But first, let's talk about these people of Philippi. So this is point number two. Paul thanks God every time he remembers the Philippians. So let's talk about these Philippians. Let's get into a little story here. Let's talk about the time Paul first goes to Philippi and we have this story played out of what it was like when Paul met these Philippians. So here we are going to flip from Philippians Half of you aren't even smiling. We got 13 weeks of this joke. It's going to be awesome. So if you would flip from Philippians, there it is again, to Acts. Acts chapter 16 is when Paul first goes to Philippi. So flip there (laughs) from Philippians. There it is. One more time, just so you could shake your head. To the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6. And what I'm going to do here is, is it'll be on the board. I will kind of uh, say where I'm at along the way, but I'm not going to read uh, all of chapter 16. We're going to kind of uh, uh, just preface it and, and go through it quite quickly. So in verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions. And we know from the rest of the story, if, if you've been uh, studying the book of Acts, that this is Paul. This is Silas, this is Timothy, and it talks a few times in us language. So the writer, the author of the book of Acts is along with this journey, which do you know his name, author of Acts? Luke, who also wrote the book of Luke. And so here's, we at least know, we don't know how many people there were total, but there was at least these guys, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. They are in what is today Turkey, Galatia, uh, and Ephesus. And then Paul in verse 9 during the night has a vision of a man from Macedonia. We've already said that the Macedonia is the region in which Philippi is in, standing and begging him. So in the night, uh, is it a dream? I'm not sure. But there's a vision that Paul has, a man from Macedonia that says, come to Macedonia and help us. Paul has seen this vision and at once got ready to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called him to preach the message there of the gospel to them. So think about this. That's a quite a beautiful thing that Paul and his companions are like, what's next, Lord? We're listening. You know, lead us to the place you want us to go. And then a vision from the Lord. And so as quickly as they can, they pack up everything and they Go, what a great way to live our lives as, as we ask for direction from the Lord. We're asking and asking, and then we hear something, we see something, we have a, a, some sort of vision, and we just follow that, trusting and hoping that that is the Lord. It's beautiful. So Paul goes from Troas. He goes, uh, verse 12 says, there we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony, the leading city of that district in Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. And so what I'm about to say is just several days. It seems like months or maybe years that all these stories, but it was just several days that all of these stories we're about to get to happen. And uh, there's a joke that whenever Paul would go to a new city, he would go first to the jail because he would want to know where he was spending the night. (laughs) <laughs> Just a joke, he didn't really do that, but actually it, it comes across, it, I'm not sure how many days he's in Philippi, but very quickly he does end up going to jail. So, getting uh, moving to verse 13, the Sabbath day, they went to the, the gate, 
city gate to the river where they expected to find a place of prayer. Uh, supposedly it wasn't a big enough synagogue or a Jewish settlement in Philippi, so they go to a place where maybe they heard or maybe they assumed the Jewish people would gather. They sit down to speak to the women who had gathered there, and one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia. We already mentioned her, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God, so she believed in the Old Testament, uh, a good Jewish woman celebrating the Sabbath and praying. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. What is Paul's message? Well, that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God himself. And God, the creator, this God of the Old Testament has come in human form, fully human, fully God, into this world to show us that he is the way. That's the message. And so she receives it. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So all these companions go to Lydia's house. She must have been quite wealthy to have a house with lots of people to welcome them in. And then skipping to verse 16, here comes another story. This story is bizarre. Um, I wish we had a whole sermon we could spend just on this story and explaining the weirdness, but we'll just kind of go over and we'll agree. Like, this is kind of a weird story and we'll just jump right in. So it's only going to get weirder from here. Once we were going to the place of prayer that we you know, already sat down by the river where these women were praying and we were met by a female slave who had a spirit. And this is, this is an interesting word here. Uh, uh, we assume some sort of like uh, spirit that's a distracting spirit, like a spirit, uh, a demonic spirit, or was it just a, uh, I have no idea. So we'll, we'll just leave some of these questions on the table and say, yes, we, we can come back to these later. Uh, but she had a spirit and she predicted the future and she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. So you could go visit this woman and you say, oh, what are the lottery numbers? And she'd tell you. And then you know, she would predict the future. She would give you advice. Uh, she had a spirit that could do that. And verse 17, moving along, she followed Paul and the rest of them, the uh, rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And verse 18 says, she kept this up for many days. So imagine this woman like in tow, these guys are moving around and telling people about Jesus. And there's this woman screaming. It says she's shouting, these men are from the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she's going on and on. She's screaming this for days. And Paul uh, at some point seemingly gets annoyed. How do I know that? Because it says that. And imagine this woman. She's like, okay, 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 calm down. Can you go maybe just wait by that tree over there? And we are going to go tell these people how to be saved. She's like, yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, I'll be over here. These men are telling you how to be saved. And Paul's like, okay. You told them that we're going to tell them. Now, can we just tell them? And she's like, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll just be over here. These men, for days, she's going on and on. Paul, it says, finally, Paul gets so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. And then it says, the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and drug them into the marketplace to face the authorities. So is this, an, I, I wish I knew more details here of what's going on. Because she's saying what is true. But she's annoying Paul and kind of distracting people from hearing the message. So Paul says to this demon, to the spirit, get out of her. The spirit comes out and then the owners are, get upset because now they're not going to make money off of her. Do you see this story? Is anyone else confused and want more details? I would love more detail. I have no idea. Like this, it's a little weird. Uh, I get it though. So then this trouble erupts. They bring Paul and Silas. I'm not sure how Luke and Timothy, they weren't there or the other ones, but they brought them, Paul and Silas, before the magistrates. These men are Jews. Verse 21, by advocating the customs unlawful for Romans, which was calling Jesus Lord and not Caesar Lord. And then verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And then it goes on to say, verse 23, they were severely flogged. Like these men, uh, Paul and Silas were stripped. We assume like completely naked in the town. 
for embarrassment and to be beaten severely with rods. Like, where's the jury? Where's the judge? Where's the, you know, nowhere. That These men are just beaten right there in the street, thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, fastened their feet, stocks. Like, if, like this is our day and age. These men wouldn't be beaten, first of all. If they were, they would probably be brought to the hospital to be cared for in an IV drip. Instead, they're just brought to a dark cell, completely dark, chained their feet to the ground. They are suffering. They are in a bad place. And yet, something awesome happens. Do you know what happens next? Do you know what the reaction is of Paul and Silas? Their reaction, yes, is to worship the Lord, to sing hymns to him, and to pray. Like what a great response to hardship to pray, to worship the Lord. I think of my wife just does this naturally. Yesterday was a hard day for us. Uh, someone we know passed away and, and my wife is helping with the family and, and cleaning things. It's just a hard day. What does she do when she comes home? She sings, she prays. This is an image of what Paul and Silas are doing. They're locked up they're chained, having been beaten. It's the middle of the night. Verse 25 says, At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Think about that testament, the, the testimony that these two men are, wow, right? Locked up, beaten, near dead, and what are they doing? Joy unspeakable, they won't go away. Just enough strength to live for today so I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring because my faith is on solid rock. I'm counting on... Like, they weren't singing that song because Jared Anderson just wrote that song a couple years ago, but they were singing something. Can you picture this in your head? A dark basement chained. I've been there. We have the picture, right? Uh, uh, can you put up the picture of uh, when I got to go there? I was just like, wow, this is where this happened. Like right here, here's me smiling like a cheese ball, pointing to the plate. I think just to the left of where my finger is, is like this hole that goes down. And that's the prison where this scene happened. The whole city of Philippi, like I said, is like four football fields. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is where this happened. Paul and Silas beaten to near death, stripped naked, now they're in chains underground. It's dark. It's the middle of the night. And what are they doing? Singing hymns and praying to God. Wow, that is joy. And then suddenly, many of you know the rest of this story. Suddenly there was an earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. What happens? Kind of skipping ahead. Uh, the, the chains break off. The prisoners are, are released. Verse 27 says the jailer wakes up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself. Why? Well, because he, he knew he had messed up bad. He was told to watch these guys. They all, all the prisoners are out. He assumes the worst. I've talked to other cops and guards and one of their greatest fears is to be in the prison in which they were once guarding. And so he is about to just kill himself. He is completely hopeless. Paul shouts out, verse 28, don't harm yourself. We are all still here. Instead of running away, they stayed. In verse 29, the jailer called for lights. That's why I said it's completely dark. He rushed in and fell before Paul and Silas. And he must have known that this message they were saying was true that he had, he had seen them singing praises in the middle of the night after being beaten because this jailer, verse 30, brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow, what a question, right? Like, what a story. Like, this really happened. And Paul and Silas begin to explain to him what he must do to be saved. A great question for us. Like if you're in here wondering this question, what is this church all about? What is Jesus all about? What is this joy that people are talking about? What does it mean to be saved? Here's the reply. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, you and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. I mean, just another uh, just a visual of like they, they hadn't even been washed up yet. They were just thrown into jail. Here they are being washed. And immediately he and his household were baptized. I assume that night. And the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. And he was filled with 
joy. Like once again, here's this theme coming out because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So that's the story of Paul and Silas going to Philippi. Fast forward a couple years, we assume something like 10 years, Paul is in another jail and somewhere else, we're not exactly sure, writing a letter back to the Philippians. And this is point number three. We see it in the verse tonight read for us. We will see it all throughout this book of the Bible that joy permeates the pages of Philippians as it should our lives as well. Think about all these references. There's lots of references about joy in the book of Philippians that we will get to as this series progresses. Philippians 1.6, I always pray for you with joy. We read that today. Philippians 1.8, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. 125, I shall remain and continue with you in all your progress and joy of faith. 2.2, uh, Philippians, uh, fulfill my joy being like-minded. Rejoice in the day of Christ. That's Philippians 2.6. I am poured out like a drink offering, and I am glad, and I, am, I rejoice. That's Philippians 2.7. Philippians 2.18, be glad and rejoice with me. Then some words about uh, this guy, Epaphroditus. When you see him, rejoice. Philippians 2.29, receive him in, all the, in the Lord with all gladness. Verse 3 one says rejoice in the Lord. Verse 3, 3 says rejoice in Christ. Again and again and again. Rejoice, be glad, my joy. I am rejoicing greatly. That's 4.10. My favorite one is Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. That's Philippians 4.4. 4. And joy is a much deeper thing, a solid foundation thing compared to happiness. We talk sometimes about being happy and are you happy? And happiness kind of comes and goes. Happiness bases upon like uh, the circumstances. In fact, the word hap is an old English word for uh, chance. Like you have chance and sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen, and you're happy or sad based on those. And joy can run underneath that. Because where is Paul writing this letter? He's in jail. In fact, we know that because he says, I'm in chains. He is literally in jail, and yet he talks about joy. So his happenings, it doesn't really seem to matter for Paul. And I think he's encouraging us as well that there can be joy, a deep joy that is in us because of Christ and his work that does not depend on the happenings of our day-to-day -day life. Two-thirds of Americans uh, say, uh, there's some sort of poll out there, you can look up other polls, I've seen other ones that are, make it even more sad, but a this big one that was done, the study said two-thirds of Americans are not happy. And here we are living in the, the land of the pursuit of happiness, and yet only one-third of Americans would say, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm happy. Two-thirds of Americans are not happy. And yet happiness, we would say as Christians, well, that kind of comes and goes, but joy, true joy needs to be in our lives. There's a famous preacher by the name of Billy Sunday. He was a famous uh, baseball player in the 1800s, became an evangelist. And he just has this uh, cute quote that I really enjoy. He says, if there's no joy in your life, then there must be a leak somewhere in your Christianity. It's like joy needs to uh, just permeate our lives. The gravity of this letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians, is this, this hymn, this passage, this poem in chapter two about where true joy comes from, and it is Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to take advantage of, but he humbled himself and made himself a servant, and he serves us. And today we're gonna, in just a couple minutes, we're gonna take communion, and we are going to uh, participate in this meal, in celebrating and remembering Christ's death. Why would we celebrate that? Well, because of what it means. The cross is the place where Jesus died. That's why it's the center of this room, because Jesus' work for us on the cross was finished. His death gave us life, gives us joy. And that is what Paul wants to remind the Philippians of. This morning, would you stand with me? We're going to pray. We're going to prepare ourselves for communion. The band can come forward in just a second. Brett will be here to lead us to the table. With your head bowed, 
Lord, we pray to you this morning that these words that you spoke through Paul many years ago, you inspired in this text, in this letter, have everything to do with joy, that we might find joy in any circumstance because you, Jesus, the creator of all, came into this world, you lived, you died as one of us, fully God, fully man, that we might know you, Jesus, that we might know you, God, and spirit living in us. So Lord, as we take a moment and we quiet ourselves, we rest in your joy, Lord, you remind us of yourself, of the table that you have set before us. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are giving. And Lord, you bring to us joy in the midst of all of life and the life's happenings.